Thank you for making time to come here. Um, we're grateful to, that uh, Peter Gurig is available to us tonight and is giving his time so we might learn with him. My name is Steve Monhull, and I'm one of the members of the Steering Committee and the Holocaust uh, Observances Committee of Greeley and Northern Colorado. So we welcome you tonight. We have uh, brochures back there. We also have a donation box. This, you'll notice everything you've been to is without cost. And uh, the reason is people like you contribute. So uh, if you have a car you don't need or something like that, or a farm or something, uh, put it in that box over there and we'll make sure it has a good home. Um, the other thing uh, tonight, those who plan to go to the movie at UNC, it begins at 7.30 tonight rather than 7. And our plan is to conclude this around 7. And certainly if you want to stay and ask uh, questions, you're welcome to do that. So I want to uh, welcome Peter Gurig uh, to us and to hear about his experience in Hungary and his insights about being a survivor. Thank you for coming out tonight. I am Peter Gerg, the guy whose name is there. Uh, a little bit of, a little bit of explanation. Sorry. Uh, the name in uh, brackets. That's the name in my birth certificate. Uh, that's the name of my father and the married name of my mother. It's part of my story and part of the Holocaust history in Hungary and in Europe. Probably many of you know that Jewish people have Jewish sounding names. So when time came and there was persecution and discrimination against Jews, it was very easy to identify who were Jewish just by looking at their name, especially in Hungary where the local language is Hungarian. And so if you didn't have a Hungarian name, you were a foreigner. And Hungarians didn't have much love for foreigners and uh, definitely not for Jews. So I changed my name in 1962, uh, just before I started college. And I changed it because my mom, who survived and um, who saved my life during the Holocaust, asked me to change my name. Because in 1962, in Hungary, it was a communist system. We were not persecuted uh, because we were Jews. Anti-Semitism was latent uh, because the communist system just didn't like any religion, not just uh, the Jewish religion. So. My mom was afraid that one day uh, anti-Semitism will come back. And um, she was, among many things, um, a prophetess, because when the communist system collapsed, anti-Semitism came about. And today there is a party in the Hungarian parliament with approximately 20% of the seats uh, who are openly anti-Semitic and racist. And um, so I was an obedient boy, and I changed my name. And this is uh, why you have this unpronounceable Gurug, which is my name. A little bit of history and uh, geographic. I don't think I have to tell you where Hungary is in Europe. I put this uh, map on the screen to explain one of the reasons why anti-Semitism was rampant in Hungary. The yellow borders show Hungary before First World War. Hungary was on the losing side of that war, actually Hungary during his long history was almost always the losing side of history. And as a result, the Versailles Peace Treaty and uh, the Trianon uh, 
peace agreement where they redraw the borders of Europe, took approximately 30% of the Hungarian territories and attached to the surrounding countries. Some of them did, didn't even exist before First World War, like uh, Yugoslavia <coughs> and um, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, which uh, consisted Czechoslovakia, wasn't a country before the war. Anyway, after the war, there was a tremendous resentment and uh, because of this loss of uh, about one third of the Hungarian population uh, to the surrounding countries. And as always happened and happens in history, people tried to find scapegoats and Jews were always easy to target and scapegoats. So anti-Semitism in Hungary after First World War resulted in the first anti-Semitic law in Europe. Uh, 15 years before the infamous Nuremberg laws and that law restricted Hungarian Jews, the number of Hungarian Jews in higher education institutions. And um, so that uh, was part of Hungary's history and uh, part of my family's history when it came to the Holocaust. 1940, Second World War was already on and Hungary were allied with Nazi Germany. The Hungarian troops reoccupied uh, those territories which were taken away from them after the First War, and also they had the Nazi army, the Wehrmacht, when they attacked uh, the Soviet Union and occupied actually almost all Europe. In 1940, October, the Hungarian government set up the so-called forced labor camps and the forced labor battalions. This institution was very specific to Hungary. The history of the Holocaust in Hungary is a little bit different from the history of the Holocaust in the rest of the Europe, namely because Hungary wasn't occupied by Nazi Germany until 1944, just one year before the war ended. However, the Hungarian government was as anti-Semitic as the German government. The Hungarian laws, anti-Semitic laws were as strict as the German laws. Hungarian Jews cannot couldn't own businesses, Hungarian Jews couldn't uh, practice certain uh, professions. Their numbers uh, in certain areas were restricted, certain professions. And um, my father was among the 100,000 Hungarian Jewish males between age 18 and 55 who were recruited, not recruited actually, they forced into these uh, forced labor battalions. My mom was already pregnant with me in October 1940 when my father was taken away. And when I was born, my father wasn't there. And the picture you see on the screen is the only picture I have with my mom, my dad, and myself. He was released from this um, camp for a long weekend. He came and he went back, and that was the last time he saw me. At the end of 1942, the Hungarian uh, army went with the German Wehrmacht into the Soviet Union, especially the Ukrainian part what was the Soviet Union at that time. And um, the people who were in these forced labor battalions, among them was my father. This is the last picture of him just uh, before he was uh, taken away. If the, I don't know if the laser works, but the arrow points to my father. This is the last picture of him. 
what happened to him and what happened to the 40,000 out of the 100,000 who perished uh, in the forced labor battalions, we don't know exactly because the only thing we know that uh, my mother got a notification from the Hungarian Ministry of Defense that my father disappeared on January 19, and in February she got another paper which declared him dead. How he died and where exactly died, we don't know. He doesn't have a marked grave, but we did do know what happened uh, to those people who died under those circumstances. These were people who were underfed, people who didn't have other quite clothes for the very harsh Russian winter, especially the 42, 43 winter was very harsh. Temperatures were uh, minus 30, minus, minus 45 degrees. Also, the snow was knee high, sometimes uh, all the way up to the waist. And these uh, people who weren't fed properly, who didn't have medical attention, who didn't have adequate clothes, they had to march under those circumstances. And if they were weak and couldn't march any longer and sat down, it take took only 10 minutes the most to be frozen to death. So many of them died because they froze to death. Others were shot by Hungarian officers who called it mercy killing because they didn't want these people to suffer even 10 minutes. So when they sat down and didn't want to march any longer or couldn't march any longer, they shot them. Some of them died because they were used to defuse the mines which was left behind by the retreating Soviet Red Army to slow down the progress of the Wehrmacht and the Hungarian army with them. And the way they defused those mines was that uh, in front of the regular troops, they had the people in the forced labor battalion to march through the minefield and the mines exploded and so did the people. So that's my father's story. My mom and I lived in Budapest at that time. My mom was a female hat maker and it was a very good uh, profession that time. Uh, hats were very fashionable and she made a good living. We had a comfortable middle class life in Budapest. We had a nice apartment. My mom had a shop. She could even hire a nanny for me while she was in the shop. Uh, she took care of me. Interestingly enough, this young uh, girl uh, who came from a little village uh, somewhere in Hungary to make a living in Budapest lost her job because at one point the Hungarian government decreed that um, no non-Jews can work for Jews, period. Uh, whatever capacity, they just could not. So my mom was desperate to have a help. This young lady was desperate to make a living, but that was the time they lived in. What I am telling you today is uh, only partially my personal memory, because I was only four years old where the Budapest ghetto was liberated by the Soviet Red Army, where my mom and I survived. What I know about our history, I know from my mom who late in my life, actually very late in my life. I was already living in the United States. I was 40 plus years old. 
That's when I started to ask her questions about what happened to my father, what happened during the Holocaust. And that's when she opened up and started to tell the stories, telling me about a diary. She started uh, right after I was born. Her purpose was not uh, really to have a diary. Oh, I think I have to point that way. But she just wanted to make sure that she would remember everything what happened to us, what uh, were the first words I said or mispronounced. Some were really funny reading with uh, hindsight. What I liked, what I didn't like. I do know that I didn't like water. I didn't like to be bathed or going to the pool even. And so three of uh, these notebooks survived, and I can reconstruct uh, some of the things what happened to us. Uh, also, my mom preserved uh, some of the postcards my father sent from the forced labor camps. Uh, am I in your way? No, I was saying, look how much you got on that. <laughs> you are very, very observant, uh, uh, really, because uh, that's not normal that somebody writes in such a tiny letters, but because that was the only way to communicate, to send one postcard per week or every other week and write as much as he can. He couldn't write about what he was doing, where he was, because uh, it was censored by a military uh, censor. The only thing he could write about was how he was feeling and what uh, he went through and what his hopes were. So I would like to share with you some of the things from my mom's um, diary and from uh, one of my father's postcards, just uh, to give you a glimpse how people felt during those times and what their dreams, what their hopes were. And uh, here is what my mom wrote about her love. Addressing my father, you have no idea how much I, sorry, long to see you. The thought of seeing you and having you next to me drives me to insanity. Why the good Lord punishes me so much that the one I adore you the most is separated from such a long time. From love, she goes to desperation, just a few paragraphs done. I cannot stand these horrible situations. I'm heading to a nervous breakdown. I try to control myself and try to believe that you are not in any trouble. You just haven't had an opportunity to write. That was probably at the time because my mom didn't put dates on uh, her notes. So I tried to reconstruct from the contents of the, uh, her writing what when it could have happened. And this was probably written at the time of that she got the last postcard from my father. And there was a long uh, hiatus and uh, no more postcards came. And from desperation, she goes to consolation. One day I will show, uh, one day you will show up at our door without any advance notice. And then I would not switch with anyone in the world. I will be the most happy person ever lived. There is only one thing that keeps me going. This is the only one thing. Unfortunately, this uh, meant not to be. My father never came back. My mom hoped against hope that one day she, he would, but it never happened. And how my father felt around the same time about my mom, about me. My little uh, dear squirrel, this is a Hungarian uh, term of uh, uh, passion. 
please write exhaustive letters, and if you can, please send lots of pictures of yourself and little Peter. I gaze on the pictures I have, and they give me strength to struggle. When I get home, we will talk a lot. We work. The work is very hard, but I'm getting stronger, getting used to it, and thanks to God, I can endure in good health. He endured as long as he could, and uh, one day the notice uh, from the Hungarian Department of Defense came and uh, told my mom that um, he disappeared, and later on he was declared dead. We lived in uh, Budapest uh, that time. We still lived in our own apartment. My mom still had uh, her job. We still had uh, some food to eat. Uh, food was already rationed. But we still had our life and our hope that we will survive. <clears throat> January Oh, sorry, March 19, 1944, the German army invaded Hungary and occupied it. The war was about to wind on, and Nazi Germany didn't trust the Hungarian government that uh, they will stick with them. So um, Hungary was the last country in Hungary the Germans occupied. And Hungary was the last country from where the deportation of the Jews started in April 1944. In a matter of three months, <coughs> approximately 425,000 Hungarian Jews were deported from Hungary to the death camps in Nazi death camps, German death camps in Poland, Treblinka, Sabibor, Auschwitz-Birkenau, and in a matter of uh, three months, almost half of the Hungarian Jewry died. Actually, by the end of the war, a year later, out of the 800,000 Hungarian Jews, 600,000 perished uh, during the Holocaust. Three out of every for Hungarian Jews. I use the word perish because not all of them were killed by the Nazis. Not all of them died in the gas chambers of the death camps. Uh, many of them died of natural causes. If you think it's natural that somebody dies of a flu, because uh, his body was so weak and uh, there was no food available, there was no medication available, and that's how my grandparents died in 1942, uh, way uh, before the Hungarian deportation started. And the only reason uh, they had to suffer was because they were Jewish, uh, the rationing of the food, of course, first went to the Hungarians, the non-Jewish Hungarians, and whatever was left was left for the Hungarian Jews. After the Nazi occupation, not only the deportation of the Hungarian Jews started first from the countryside, the Jews who lived in Budapest, among them my mom and myself, were relatively safe. We were forced to leave our um, apartment, and the picture you see is the rounding up of the Hungarian Jews after the Nazi occupation. I wanted to show this picture for uh, one reason, and the reason is that on the picture you see the perpetrators of the Holocaust. You see a Nazi soldier on the left side. You see the victims 
in the middle of the pictures, uh, Jewish. Pardon? Could you dim the lights, please? Uh, Thank you. Sorry if uh, it's not, uh, uh, um, you cannot see from far apart. Uh, you can see the Hungarian Jews uh, walking down one of the streets of Budapest wearing the yellow Star of David, which was mandatory for every Jew when uh, they went outside to their apartment. And in the background, uh, you can see, if you can see, people standing by, and some of them are smiling. And they were one group of the people who were part of the Holocaust, they were the bystanders. They were the people who saw what was happening and did absolutely nothing. And that was the good case. The worst case was when they were even smiling, when they saw what was happening to their neighbors, to their colleagues, people they knew, who suffered only for one reason, because they were Jewish. And uh, that's one lesson I always try to bring up for everybody in the audience, young people and not so young people, that in time of trouble, time when hatred is rampant, when people are discriminated against because of their religion, in the case of Holocaust, or because of the color of their skin, or because of their sexual orientation, one cannot be a bystander, because the bystanders are as guilty as the perpetrators. What happened to us was that um, in 1944, April, the Hungarian government decided that they gather the Jewish population, the remaining Jewish population of uh, Budapest at one place, and that was the Budapest ghetto. That was an approximately five by eight city blocks, which was the traditional Jewish quarter of Budapest. And that's where most of the people, most of the Jews had to move. They had to leave everything behind in a, an apartment. My mom was able to jam as much as she could in a small suitcase, and I was, uh, or she was holding my hands as we were walking, not to Budapest ghetto, not to one of the houses which, uh, were, which are marked with a yellow star of uh, David, which were the so-called designated houses, where a uh, non-Jewish resident had to move out, and all the Jews had to move in, sometimes three, four, five families not related to each other at all had to live in a, a two-bedroom apartment. My mom perceived that uh, there is an imminent danger if we go to a place where they gather all the Jewish people, because obviously there is an ulterior uh, motive behind it. Mind you that uh, the Jews of Budapest and the world as a whole didn't know much about what was happening in the concentration camps uh, and the killing camps. There were rumors, but nobody could believe when they heard that uh, hundreds of thousands of people were taken to gas chambers and uh, their bodies were burned in the crematoriums. Anyway, my mom had a childhood friend who was married that time, but they didn't have a child or children, and they took us in. We were hiding. This couple risked their very own life in order to save our lives because the law said that Jews who are hiding will be punished and sent immediately uh, to the death camps and people who were hiding Jews, who were non-Jews, would have the same fate. We lived in this apartment for approximately three weeks when uh, 
a neighbor uh, reported us to the police. The police came and arrested my mother. Uh, that's a personal memory of mine. I remember the fancy uniform of the two policemen who came into the apartment and uh, arrested my mom. We were sitting around the breakfast table when it happened. When she was led away, the host couple told me that, don't worry, just there are some administrative things my mom have to clear up and she will be back. She came back two days later and later she told me the story what happened during those two days. As soon as she was taken to one of the most infamous jail where many Jewish uh, people died and People who were declared by the Hungarian government the enemies of the people who were communist, socialist, or just people who didn't like Nazis. They were taken to this uh, jail. And when my mom got there, she had that paper from the Hungarian Ministry of Defense which said that uh, my father died during war activities. And she claimed that she was a war widow. War widow was a special title for those wives whose husband served in the regular Hungarian army and who died for fighting for Hungary. And they had all kind of privileges. Among them was a higher uh, portion when uh, uh, food was not available or uh, other uh, privileges I cannot recall exactly. My mom was not a war widow according to the law because her husband, my father, was not part of the regular Hungarian army. He was in the forced labor battalion where he was a forced uh, a slave laborer. But because the paper came from the Ministry of Defense, she could deceive or uh, uh, proclaim that uh, she was a war widow. So when the warden saw this paper and my mom threatened him that uh, he's going to be in big trouble because they arrested a war widow, which was a like sainthood, uh, he took my mom to the commandant, uh, to the jail, who either knew what that paper was but had pity on my mom and released her, or he himself was ignorant and didn't know what that paper was, other than it came from the Hungarian Ministry of uh, Defense declared my father dead. So if my father was dead, uh, declared by the Ministry of Defense, then my mom should be a war widow. Anyway, my mom came home. Well, it wasn't our home. It was the home of uh, this uh, non-Jewish couple. And we had to move again. We couldn't wait uh, any longer that somebody else would report us again. And where we moved was the so-called uh, protected houses. Earlier, I talked about the so-called designated houses, designated by the Hungarian government for Jews to live there. These protected houses were the property of the Swedish embassy. What happened in 1944, the United States government recognized that there were um, plenty of Jews still living in Europe and they already knew what was their fate. President Roosevelt set up the so-called War Refugee Board and the purpose of this board was to send people in Europe in diplomatic uh, disguise and save as many Jewish people as they can. The Hungarian government uh, gave certain amount of money 
and also there were money given uh, by private donors. Rolf Wallenberg, a Swedish aristocrat who was Protestant, who had no relationship uh, to Hungary whatsoever, came uh, to Budapest as a Swedish diplomat and bought up 32 apartment buildings and he put the sign of the Swedish embassy on these buildings. What happened was that by international law, buildings which belonged to an embassy in a foreign country was treated like the territory of the country who sent uh, the diplomat who, or who owned the property. So that was Swedish territory by international law. And for whatever reason, Hungary broke all the laws, but they somehow kept this one law and people, Jewish people, who were able to move into one of these 32 apartment buildings, among them was my mom and myself. They were safe. We were safe for a while. In October 15, 1944, the far right Hungarian Nazi party, the so-called Aerocross, took over the Hungarian government and they couldn't care about international laws anymore. The Hungarian Nazis came into these houses. Uh, they arrested people who lived there. Some of them were led to the railway station, or actually not even a railway station, to a brickyard uh, in the outskirts of Budapest, which had a train connection where the raw material came in and uh, in freight trains and uh, the bricks were uh, shipped away. This time the load was not brick, this time the load was Jewish people who 80, 100 of them was forced to embark in a cattle car or freight car. And they started an approximately five day trip from Hungary to Poland to Auschwitz-Birkenau. If you ever visited the, Hungary, the United States Holocaust Museum, there is a, not a replica, but the freight car made by the same company at the same time when uh, these cars were um, used for deportation of Jews from all over Europe. And you can walk through the freight car if you've never been one, and you can imagine, well, actually, you cannot imagine what it meant to have 80 people who had only enough room to stand for five days without food, without water. So by the time this train arrived to Auschwitz, uh, many people was already dead. As I said, uh, we were uh, in this uh, protected, one of these uh, protected houses until October 15, 1944 when those uh, Nazis who surrounded uh, the building while we were living there for approximately three months, they came into the building and went through apartment by apartment, um, leading people away. And when they came to our apartment, it was, um, I usually say at this time, because neither my mom I can explain what happened to us, whether it was sheer luck or uh, divine uh, providence. The young Nazi who came into our apartment was a Nazi I befriended uh, during those three months we were living in that apartment building. And uh, little kids uh, between two bombing raids, we were playing the inner court of this apartment building that was a made-up uh, playground. And um, 
young boys, we pretended to be policemen and robbers, and we were shooting each other uh, with sticks and whatever we could uh, uh, have at that time. And um, we had the yellow star of David on my clothes, and these n young Nazis who were uh, protected this building, actually, they or didn't want anybody to leave those buildings, um, had good fun with us uh, seeing these Jewish, little Jewish boys or girls shooting at each other and pretending they were dead. Sometimes, and again, it was very exciting for me, a four-year-old boy, boy, to have a real weapon in my head. They fortunately unloaded their uh, rifles and handguns and they gave us to use real weapons against each other just to make their fun even um, better. Uh, anyway, these, the young Nazi who came to our apartment recognized me. He knew my, me by my first name. And uh, when his friends came also to lead us away, he told them, to leave them behind. I know little Peter, let's go to the next apartment. And they went to the next apartment, and unfortunately, those people weren't as lucky. Anyway, as soon as the Nazis left the building, we had to move again, and this time we moved into the Budapest ghetto. We moved to my grandparents, my mother and our grandparents' uh, one-bedroom apartment where uh, my two aunts and my cousins already lived with my grandparents. One bedroom apartment for uh, six people, not much room uh, to have a normal life, but life wasn't normal by that time. The Allied forces, uh, both the Sov Soviets and the British and the Americans, relentlessly bombed Budapest. So we spent most of our time at the bottom or the basement of the building, where usually the wood or the coal, which was used for uh, stoves uh, and furnaces, which kept the apartments warm during the winter, that was a storage place uh, with dirt floor. And that's where I spent my last uh, three months uh, during the Holocaust. By this time, electricity uh, was turned off, uh, water. I don't know where my mom got water from, but I don't remember ever being thirsty, or for that matter, hungry, because whatever my mom, whatever food my mom could uh, get, uh, she gave it to me. We couldn't keep the strict orthodox uh, dietary laws. Uh, by this time, we ate whatever uh, my mom and my grandma could put her or their hands on. What happened was that during two bombing raids, uh, people who still were surviving in the temporary bomb shelters, went out, and they went to the bombed out buildings, and they were rummaging through whatever food they could find, and they brought it back. It didn't matter if the food was spoiled, or uh, there was mold on the bread, or uh, for that matter, it was bacon, which, uh, according to Jewish dietary law, we shouldn't have eaten. But we did, because every calorie we took at that time meant maybe one more day of survival and one more day of hope that we will survive long enough that uh, the ghetto will be liberated. So we ate a big slab of bacon without bread, and Hungarian bacon is not like the American one. There is no meat in it. It's just a big blob of lard. And it's uh, peppered with uh, paprika and salt. 
and um, that's what we ate, and we were happy to have it. January 1945, the Budapest ghetto is liberated by the Soviet Red Army. We were free. We were free to go home. We went home. I do remember walking through the bomba, bombed out Budapest. The street was scattered with uh, dead bodies. Uh, the stench, uh, I still can. Uh, remember uh, dead horses. Uh, there were uh, horse-drawn carts delivering groceries and whatnot in 1940s, early 1940s in Budapest. So that's the image I have. We went back to our old apartment, and we were among the very few lucky ones who found everything in our apartment intact. A family moved in when we moved out, and they preserved everything. And not only they preserved everything, when they saw us coming back, they were happy to see us, um, and they left the apartment. And that was very unique, because most of the survivors who went back to their apartment, they weren't as lucky, even if they found their apartment and nobody was living there, there was nothing left. It was looted. Again, we were the lucky ones, survived. We had our apartment back. We applied for an immigration visa to the United States. Uh, I had an aunt and uncle who were lucky enough to leave uh, Hungary before the Holocaust. They lived in Baltimore, Maryland. They were happy to have us. They signed an affidavit that they're going to take care of us. It was a long bureaucratic process. Not only that, but we had to wait and wait and wait because there was a very strict quota system for immigration. And uh, a very small number of people were allowed, and there were different quotas for different countries. While we were waiting between 1946 and 1945, the 46 to 49, the Hungarian Communist Party, with Soviet help, took over the government. They closed the border, and a new life started in a communist Hungary. I don't have time to tell you uh, what it meant. We were alive. We weren't persecuted because we were Jewish, but we definitely weren't free. And we were restricted in so many ways. Among them was that um, I uh, didn't get a Jewish education. My mom, who was an Orthodox observant Jew, before the war, during the war, every Friday night, I don't know where they could find a candle, but that's what Jewish people do every Friday night, to light a candle. They lit the candle, they said the traditional uh, prayers, and they uh, blew out the, the flame because uh, the candle was needed. Um, just to have some light during the night because we didn't have electricity. Anyway, after the war, my mom turned away from Judaism. She, as many other Jews, just couldn't believe anymore in a God who allowed to happen what happened to six million Jews. Anyway, uh, just make the long story short. Uh, we are running out of time. I grew up in communist Hungary. I got a good education. I became an electrical engineer. I was uh, lucky to get a good job in a company which worked on the first Hungarian design computer. I learned everything about computers, not in the kindergarten, but uh, on my first job computer hardware and software. So when in 1980, I was desperate enough, and uh, I didn't have the foresight that maybe if I can endure 10 more years under communist system, communist system would collapse, which it did. 
But anyway, 1980, I came to visit uh, my aunt and uncle in Baltimore, and uh, I never went back. I never looked back. I never regretted. I started a new family here. I have uh, five girls and uh, three grandgirls, and I worked until 2014, mostly for NASA, working all the big projects you can name or you can remember. Among them, the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, the Gem James Webb Space Telescope, which is still in the making. I was working on it, but I couldn't wait uh, until they finish it. So I retired 2014. I could hardly wait to join the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I was a funding member of the museum. I contributed financially, but I couldn't volunteer because um, my family and my job took up all my time. Since then, I do various volunteer work, docenting, translating um, documents, and um, also going wherever um, I am invited and uh, share my story. And the last slide, I, that's my last day at NASA. And the last slide is uh, a part of that picture you can see in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as you step out from the freight car. Uh, these are two Hungarian students uh, in their traditional Hungarian student uniform at the platform of the Auschwitz railway station. They just arrived and they were waiting what's going to happen next. What happened next to them, and many of them, that straight from the railway station, they were led to the gas chambers where they died and the crematoriums where their bodies were burned. I owe to them, and I owe to the one million Jewish children who died during the Holocaust, who never had a chance to grow up, never had a chance to have their own families, their children or grandchildren, to preserve their memory, to tell their stories, to tell my family stories, and to encourage everybody who is willing to listen that uh, we have to do, we all have to do whatever we can to make sure that the Holocaust will never happen again. And I hope uh, that's the message you will take home tonight. Thank you so much for coming. I believe we still have a little time, and uh, whomsoever is the keeper of the time should tell uh, who has the last question, and until then, I try to answer as many as possible. I, I have one thing. Um, since Ben stood up there with you, Ben is a representative of the Holocaust, United States Holocaust Memorial no. Museum, as, as Peter is too. Peter, they're both about, oh, Peter's a volunteer, and uh, Ben is an employee. And I wondered if you might explain, um, you were in detail this afternoon, of what the Holocaust Memorial Museum does for those of us who have not visited it yet. You want to do it? You want me to start? Um, you fast, You talk faster okay. than me. <laughs> okay. so, um, oh, well, first of all, thank you to the USHMM because they sent uh, these as representatives. It's free of charge, and, and uh, we just pay the hotel and, and flights, and they, they're, they're, they're ambassadors to, to tell the world what happened. Well, I'll keep this uh, short because uh, I definitely want to get Peter back up here as well. Um, but I will say that um, currently our um, museum is, was founded for uh, our permanent exhibition, as well as the memorial that is at the museum. Um, so it is half education center, library, and half memorial, like you would see anywhere else on the mall, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, MLK, anything like that. Um, but our uh, museum has also branched out um, to try to push these lessons further out to schools like you, communities like you. Um, Peter comes along. Uh, many of our survivors will come along and speak at those. 
But in addition to that, um, our museum is also um, discussing, discovering, investigating um, modern genocide. So we send people to Turkey and Myanmar and Syria um, to collect evidence uh, firsthand, witness and testimony, um, so that we can apply the lessons taught by Peter, um, taught by his family's experiences, um, by others um, caught up in uh, the Second World War, and um, we can also make that relevant and continue to have an impact as a museum. Um, it's not so easy to do, um, to bring kids in and connect them to people like Peter. I know that you guys are here, and it's very, very easy to pull you into that, but a history book doesn't always do that, so we have to keep um, the movement of helping people that can't help themselves uh, moving forward in history. So. Um, well, actually, it's up to you. If you have questions, I would more than glad to uh, respond. I wonder if we could be sure that if, if students have questions, that, that um, we make sure you have room. Maybe you can prepare. Not that the rest of us shouldn't, but um, in any case. So we'll give you room. If there was a question. So who is the first one? Tell us about your mom and what happened with her. What happened to her, um, she raised me single-handedly until 1953 when um, she gave up the hope that uh, my father would come back and she remarried my stepfather, who was also a Holocaust survivor. He survived Auschwitz. Uh, he was one of the few who came back. And that's part of the Holocaust history that uh, he never shared his experience. And because while I was still living in Hungary, I didn't know about the Holocaust as a separate event from the war. I didn't ask the question, but I did ask one question. He had the tattoo on his arm um, and I asked him, and the two was not very common at that time, especially numbers. Anyway, um, he never told us. Uh, he took his uh, story with him. He lived until age 90. And my mom, she worked uh, until she retired. She was always an independent-minded woman. She took very good good care of herself. After I left Hungary, she was, uh, let's say, 80. She was 73 that time. She came to visit us practically every year. We wanted uh, her to stay with us permanently, but that was part of her independence. He, she went back um, every time, and she came back, and actually uh, she died here when, while she was still visiting. Uh, at the ripe age of 90. Anyone else? Well, while you are thinking about just one story, because that's also part of the Holocaust uh, story, well, maybe two, very briefly. Once, um, in 19, for, after 1944, after the Nazi occupation, my mom went out during the very short uh, curfew uh, to get uh, necessities. And while she was walking down the street, she was stopped by a high-ranking um, Hungarian military officer. And uh, my mom was uh, trembling, as she told me later, I wasn't there. Uh, the military officer who was part of the Hungarian army serving a Hungarian fascist system, he saluted her and she said, Madam, wear that yellow star of David as a badge of honor. I'm really sorry what my government uh, did to you and um, to your people. And she, he saluted and went on his way. So not everybody was evil, uh, like that couple who hid us and risked their own life, like this uh, military officer. Um, 
that were good people, there were righteous Gentiles, that's what we call those people who saved Jewish lives during the Holocaust, and their memory is preserved in the Yad Vashem, that's the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Jerusalem, and their names are uh, engraved in a marble wall there, and there are almost 3,000 names there. Question, Mintan? Yes? During your education as a teenager and as a university student in Hungary, were you taught about the Holocaust? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The Hungarian government, although that wasn't the communist government, the Hungarian government between 1933 and 1945, that's the time frame of the Holocaust, was complicit in the Holocaust. Uh, many Hungarian people uh, were complicit. There were many Hungarian bystanders. And the Hungarian government just didn't want to deal with it. And uh, so we weren't taught. There were no books published. There were no movies. TV didn't come until 1960s to Hungary. So no, we did not uh, know that there was a Holocaust. We couldn't ask the question. Uh, while there were still so many survivors, there were no Holocaust museum. So really, I learned everything after I came to the United States and uh, learned here that what happened uh, to my people first, in general, and then uh, asking my mom and doing my own research, finding out what happened during the Holocaust in Hungary. Okay. I'd like to say one thing. Uh, oh, there is a question there. Just a sec. Um, I don't know that most of you are probably aware that we were supposed to have a different Holocaust survivor representative here who got suddenly ill. And I just want to thank, even though we have a couple more questions, we want to really thank uh, Peter for making this trip at last minute, stepping in. And also, just today, he was at Central High School this morning. He was at Eden High School this afternoon, mm -hmm. doing the same, uh, his, his presentation. Then a, a reception there, where he spoke with some people, and then now this, and that's that's a lot to go through, so we want to thank you. So. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to do it, and it's an obligation on my part to do as much as I can. Yes, sir? Well, Peter, I thought if we had some time, maybe you could go back, but I saw you skip through some pictures. Yeah. I knew that you were going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, because of time constraint, and I uh, try to tailor uh, my presentation to the audience, so I... Let's see, uh, da, 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 I'm going back as far as I can. You saw all of these. Uh, I uh, skipped this one. I just wanted uh, for high schoolers and uh, for seven and eight graders, I put this map on, just make sure that they know where Hungary is. So nothing lost here. You saw this one, this one. Uh, yeah, I'm going there as fast as I can. Uh, the, <laughs> that's not my battery. <laughs> that's what happened when you... Uh oh, let's see if I can I'll click on... It. Okay, somebody clicked. Uh, uh, on this picture, I didn't explain. Rolf Wallenberg, besides uh, buying up those apartment buildings, he also gave false documents to tens of thousands of Hungarians, and those were the so-called Schutzpasses. Uh, they were given in the hope that the Hungarian authorities and the Nazis will um, accept it uh, to prove that that person was a Swedish citizen or under the protection of the uh, government. You saw these pictures. I didn't show or didn't explain all the pictures. Those are the Hungarian Nazis on the left side. You see a very young boy 
no more than 14 years old, they indoctrinated these young people in, with the Nazi ideology and they served the Nazi regime. Those are the Jews who were lined up at the Danube River and this is what happened to them. At the bottom left corner there is a memorial to those people who were shot uh, in Hungary. Those are bronze shoes because people had to uh, disrobe and um, uh, take their shoes off before they were shot. And that was for the memory of those people who died there. The reason I put it here, because sometimes I have time to tell that anti-Semitism is alive and well in Hungary. And what happened um, two weeks after this memorial was set up, somebody during the night or somebody's put uh, big shank bones in those uh, shoes. And that was an ultimate desecration of the a memorial because uh, the pig or, uh, uh, is uh, not kosher, not uh, uh, consumed by, by Jews. And so um, that just to uh, show that uh, what uh, happened um, in 2002 or 2003. This is a passport picture taken out. My mom took out uh, after we weren't able to, to use our passport to come to the uh, United States. She took out this picture and that's we, my mom and myself in 1946. And I talked about this one, talked about this one, and that's all.